Thank you very much, Gil. It is a very nice introduction myself. And also, after such a very further, rather emotional for us, Bob's video presentation, which was so much energetic on the energy process in the human brain. Today, I like to do a little bit not so energetic things, but I was encountered in my uh, very long years of career, and that is more or less process of oxygenation or deoxygenation of the system you are working on. One of those cases is the one which I work I, I had the privilege to work with Gil in mid 1970, I guess. That was uh, his uh, second visit to the Bell Lab, and uh, at the time when uh, Bob Schumann introduced in vivo and MR. Anyway, at that time, in this pro pro um, process too, we had a problem of oxygenation of uh, sample. Anyway, I have many cases in my career the process of oxygenation is very pivotal in the continuing my work. Uh, first of all, uh, in 1960, late 60s, when I went to Stanford to work with McConnell as a student, at the time McConnell switched his field from chemical physics to biophysics, claiming structure and function of macromolecule. That is more or less still banner of the biophysics field, structure and function, what is important they are. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, the method McConnell introduced at that time is spin label. Putting spin label in the protein and looking for some local conformation of a protein surrounding the spin level, whether this local conformation changes with the function of the biomolecule or not. That was a major question. So anyway, we are at the early, very early stage of biophysics. We are, although we are very much uh, proud of uh, being in biophysics in earlier than in many of the people, and we thought we are doing something important. Spin label McConnell uses to look for biological response. We tried many, many uh, spin label compounds, which you see here, it's a nitroxide free radical we saw in the earlier talk, and there's a chemi chemistry involved in here. I was working as a bi not biophysicist, but an organic chemist, which I never worked on organic chemistry. Anyway, I could make one compound like this, and I put it the hemoglobin. And I was surprised, and I was so much delighted to see spectral change by taking off oxygen. Here. This is an EPR, ESR spectrum nitroxide only part of it. This part is one of the nitrogen state. There is a center and another peak outside. We took out only part of it. If you see B here is an oxygenated state and A is deoxygenated state. We are so much delighted to see this. It's uh, certainly uh, Hemoglobin, hemoglobin conformation in some way or another responded to the oxygen con uh, presence of the hem. And uh, here, <coughs> you see here something uh, isosbestic point in the APR spectrum telling there are two conformation in the round cerebral. Uh, we don't know whether this is only two conformation in the protein or local conformation is just to prostate, or the system is just like we are only looking at 
two kinds of oxygenated state in the hemoglobin. It may not have much of the intermediate oxygenated state. Anyway, this is the way we tried to approach hemoglobin problem at that time. Now, after I moved to the Bell Lab, working with Bob Schumann, before that the in vivo and MR, we are working on also structure and the function of protein. Well, one of the topics we had is allostatic transition. That is very much hot topics in the, in a kind of a biophysical field of protein uh, response. And say, take a uh, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, if you take off oxygen, deoxyhemoglobin, if you plot free energy binding, it's the number of oxygen on the hem, has a totally oxygenated hemoglobin. Certainly, if you have enough oxygen, you see all of this, this one. If you don't have oxygen, you have all of this. At the intermediate state, we don't know where it, how it goes on. Hemoglobin has an enormous capability to deliver oxygen very efficiently in the, in the body. And uh, this kind of cooperative oxygen binding is one of the topics at that time. The allostic transition is the following way. This is a mono Wyman showing in the, in the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has two cotonized structures. One is very low oxygen affinity, a T state. The other is very high oxygen affinity. At the, without oxygen, you see this structure. If you have much ox large oxygen, you have this structure. So whenever you measure it, you measure either this or this. If this kind of model is right, somewhere it has to cross. How about the middle? Two oxygen on, whether you can see any of those changes or not? Kind of the question we had. Another question is, interesting point is, it is well known that there is an allostic effector. If you add those things like phosphate in the blood, you have a DPG, everybody has it, it stabilizes one of the structure. Because only one molecule goes on, not the four molecule, one molecule. It goes on one of those low affinity forms very strongly, to high affinity form very weakly. So if you add effector, this is energy-wise, it will go stabilized by energy of binding of phosphate. And at the mid, at the middle, there's a chance to have switch between two structures. That was the assumption, the experiment I was trying to do. Well, long, long story short, uh, at that time, in the hemoglobin or myoglobin, when you have ferric state on cyanide on, cyanoferric hemoglobin or myoglobin, you see paramagnetic shift of some of those protons on the heme or nearby. That was found by Kurt Butrich some years ago. And uh, I used those things to analyze this. So if Oh, po, 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 po. oh, it doesn't. This is a part of the paramagnetic shift at the peak, outside of the usual protein structure spectrum. You see this, is, this is the alpha chain, alpha beta pair in that is a hemoglobin. This one was Cyanomet, it's oxygenated, low spin state. If you have beta part, you can take on and off of the oxygen. Here's the oxygen on it. If I take oxygen off, well, it's only small change. On the other hand, if you had the bio, uh, allostic effect to the, this oxyform, there are small changes. Even though we are looking at alpha chain spectrum, but there are small changes in the beta part. However, if you look at the oxygenated state, you add an uh, allostic effector, 
changes drastic, very strong changes. Of course, this is reversible. You can do the other pair, alpha, oxydeoxyferous, beta, cyanferric, ligated. It's also adding, adding a allosteric effect, enormous changes in a partially deoxygenated state. So this can be interpreted just like we said here. Without effector, you see low affinity form. Adding effector, it changed to, I'm sorry, high affinity form to low affinity form changes at the two ligand zone. Well, it looks like a very good interpretation for that purpose, for that model of the allosteric transition. We are very much delighted with this argument. And uh, we said, well, we finished hemoglobin. So we stopped working on hemoglobin at, completely at that time. Next came, Bob came with the idea of in vivo NMR, serial metabolism, just uh, he mentioned in his talk. And uh, I had a privilege to work with Bill at that time. There are three papers that only in that period, short period of stay. Of course, Gil had much more, many other papers that period, period, I guess. But anyway, it was a E. coli suspension and putting uh, oxygen into it and measure the change of the energetics, part of the energetics. The problem is, in order to do in vivo NMR, in NMR tube, you have a fair high concentration of uh, cells. So it's very hard to oxygenate it. Lots of work you have to work on that. Kami had a better idea than we had later. But anyway, oxygenation was very important in that case. And if you, if you add oxygen, things have changed. For example, here, the oxygenated, oxygenation happened here by bubbling oxygen. You see changes the pH, internal, this is the external, this is inter internal pH, measured by phosphate, changing the pH, delta pH. And here, I think, Gil was working to inhibit ATPS by adding DCCD. It also changed, right? I didn't look at this paper really closely. I just put it on. Then I read, read, read the paper later, and there, here is a DCCD. I was surprised. But anyway, there is an energetics you can generate delta pH in the cell. Well, but in that case, we had uh, other things that is a uh, so-called chemiosomatic uh, hypothesis by Peter Mitchell. There, ATP is work to make ATP uh, balanced with uh, in external to internal delta pH and membrane, cross-membrane potentials. We thought we could measure P13 NMR of those com components, so we did this. This is mitochondrial suspension, and we added, we oxygenated the system, and you see ATP uh, here inside and outside generated. So this is a, this give me the way to work on the Peter Mitchell's hype. This is the internal phosphate ATP itself. You can see. Well, so we try to work on the proton motive force and the internal phosphorylation potential. Well, we get uh, the ratio between the two protons required according to Peter Mitchell's. So I wanted to measure how many protons are being used for uh, balance to this kind of relation. It turns out to be in 2.3 or something. It's not 3, it's not 2, it's very inconclusive. But anyway, a uh, year or two later, Peter Mitchell Nobel Prize, surprisingly, before his Nobel Prize, so many bioenergetics people in the community worked on this, hypo, uh, this uh, uh, 
hypothesis is very strong, many people working on it. But after he got the Nobel Prize, they dropped dead. Nobody worked on it anymore. That was a very interesting experience I had. Anyway, then I switched to imaging instead of uh, MRS. Then it coming into play in the uh, SMR community. Anyway, I changed the field. And uh, I look at the uh, mouse brain. First, I had a very lousy images to see. I tried to do as a high special resolution and homogeneity on the, on the slides as possible. Starting to look at, even this is a dead animal. You see many lines in the cortical area, also in another area. Well, I was wondering what could be. Of course, I had an idea to what could be, but I wanted to show it. But anyway, one time in the Anastasia Animal Walk, uh, uh, the <clears throat> breathing uh, air, it's getting a little bit uh, unstable state. It shows some choking effect. So I changed the oxygen content. Look, uh, yeah, those, so those lines uh, disappeared. This hit the bell, a bell meaning. So I tried another experiment. That is, I euphorized animal with carbon monoxide. You know, carbon monoxide has such a 250 times more binding constant relative to the oxygen. So it knocked off all of the oxygen. Then the animal, of course, died. Look at the image. It's essentially no lines there. So him is also known as a diamagnetic. That's why we did this experiment. Anyway, in this way, we see those lines coming from component in the blood, namely the hemoglobin. Here, oxygenation, the oxygenation was very important too. So I used the board deoxygenation Uh, blood oxygenation level dependent uh, contrast. Anyway, we could use this to see in the human brain as a, in, in the Camille's lab. People in the Camille lab worked very hard using their newly installed 40 uh, imager. And uh, we see peaks, difference between Ex excited, or simulated, and resting state changes. Well, we did a, another experiment that is so-called hemifield, slightly different location from the center. We see, I hope you can see this, if you stimulate one side, it goes to the other side of the hemisphere, one side only. It's also one side only. It's a very nice activation. It's all going along the dark area, I mean the gray matter. Of course, there are some portion is very strong peak, or some portion is not so strong. But anyway, it's on the gray matter. Some years later, somebody published a paper saying, this is functional MRI can measure activation on the cortical ribbon on the hip published a paper in this way in the nature, that was surprisingly. But anyway, the paper we tried to publish in nature was detected at the front gate. Even didn't go to the reviewer. So as uh, our paper on the border effect in the 1990, we tried to publish in science, it's also they rejected at the front. They didn't even go to the uh, reviewer. So we have to publish in the PNAS. So if you, if you don't, if you have experience to be rejected by science or nature, don't discourage. There's some chance you have other, other people will appreciate what you have done. That was the kind of uh, functional MRI starting at 92. Since there is not much time, I don't like to get into 
how we are doing for the functional MRI nowadays, this is one of the small part of our work, and that is uh, when the, you stimulate one side of the him, the signal activation goes to the other side, closer, closer to the other hemisphere, how they are doing each other, how they are communicating each other. That is one of the questions too. So we did that. One side of the activation goes to up and up by showing the picture of the face. You can see. If you go the other side, you see the other side of the activation. You see. And how they are com communicating each other, we can measure it. And uh, if, you, if you look at the only visual area, only one side goes, but in other area, this is a usual so-called contra activation. This is a Ipsy, this is activation from this one coming into this. And uh, it's certainly a fair amount of activation, you can see it. The further, we did the following. Contra, usual activation, minus Ipsy, the other side coming from, the ratio to the word. This is contra Ipsy uh, prefer preference uh, index, so-called, and we try to do this in 3T, in a 3 millimeter voxel. You see some of the distribution of voxels in the activation map. It's a fairly uh, slightly favor for the uh, contra side, of course, and uh, this kind of distribution in number of voxels in population. If you do it 7T, one millimeter, Boxer side, it's much smaller. Now you see much wider distribution in terms of this Ipsy or contra preference. Some of the boxers are dominated by coming from the other side. If you go to the smaller boxer, many things you can do. In here, the big boxer contains small voxel, which has one side or another preferred. If you add together, you get this kind of distribution. If you look in this individual voxel, you see those distribution is quite different. Of course, this one millimeter voxel is still large relative to the actual neuronal system to respond to the functional processing. But anyway, if you do this with a different input, different uh, information content, you may be able to distinguish how those books are responding to various kind of input within human face. The changing the human face, you may, those books can distinguish. Nowadays, so-called uh, uh, multi-box pattern analysis, they are trying to do this kind of uh, pattern analysis, whether some activation was favored by, in this box, so you have this, and one uh, information content, it may have another box being activated with some uh, input, and you, you see the various uh, pattern of activation depending upon what kind of input you use. Well, but even, even just straightforward activation map, you may, if you look at those, those uh, boxes, how those patterns changes with different content of input information, we may be able to get better idea what those area, cortical area, specialized to processing human brain, human face, what kind of information content they are dealing with. It's a very interesting, very provocative field to go into. In addition, even small box, one millimeter, there are many other, many type of neural system maybe co coexist. Camus group was looking at the V1 for the orientation color measurement. In the higher order one, it may have more various type within it. We have approach which we can distinguish 
whether that part of the box are processing same information content or different information content. There's a way of doing it, so we are hoping to be able to do this. This is done by uh, young people in the Korea, Gachan University. Well, oh, I didn't uh, emphasize as much as the uh, importance of oxygenation to oxygenation in the system, but uh, there is a uh, many pivotal moment I have had in my own career. Thank you for your attention. Jerry? Yeah. Bob Shulman has told us how the brain uses energy for consciousness. You have told us something about the topography of brain function. But how does the brain work? How does it store information? That's yes. the real question. Yes. Bob Schumann mentioned to maintain the conscious state of brain. Lots of glucose and oxygenation, they need energy, yes. But when you have local evoked potential being made, whether that is the same energy requirement process is going on or not, still not clear, still not clear. And uh, there are lots of things going on nowadays in the resting state, MRI, and like this one. They, they are measuring uh, in, the, in the resting state lots of uh, uh, as you see in the oscillation of EEG, lots of activity going around it. And whether those activities also being uh, oxygen sensitive activity or not. But the oxygen being used to make that state available to the system. That's what we understand. Yes, okay? Not, okay. We need a number. Uh, probably, uh, Minnesota people may have, when they have activation, how much oxygen being measured, how much free CBF was measured, right? I'll try to fix that. <laughs>